And I would, I would certainly ask for you all to be prayerful. Uh, anytime we stand, we, wanna, we want the prayers of God's people. We need the prayers of God's people. We need uh, your encouragement. And um, we certainly need the Spirit of God. But this morning I want to, uh, my thought would be, and I, everybody knows I, I have a, a small streak of sarcasm, I guess, that runs in me. So this morning's title, I want you to think about what it says, but I don't want you to take it absolutely seriously. My thought this morning is sin is not so bad. Sin is not so bad, and that's uh, certainly... As we look around us today, I think we can plainly see that that has been the attitude of our world for far too long. Uh, we will examine some verses of Scripture and we'll look at some things this morning that hopefully will uh, help us to examine this and understand this a little bit more clearly. Uh, I don't think I'm going to teach you all anything that you don't already know, but maybe it will bring to remembrance some things that you've heard in the past. And maybe it will, uh, it will m maybe make sense to some folks who maybe haven't heard it before, or maybe you've heard it before, but it just never clicked until today. That's one of the things about the gospel. When we preach, we, we know that we're not preaching anything new. All of us that are preachers, we're preaching the same Bible that's been preached for thousands of years. And we see that today uh, we have the same word in front of us. It's not new. It has not been changed. And I would be uh, leery and cautious of anybody that would preach anything different other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what the Apostle Paul said. That we, we, say we, deserve, we uh, intend to know nothing of, uh, among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So my desire this morning is not to bring anything new, but rather to enlighten us to the reality of the world in which we live. And as, uh, as I think about uh, what uh, Sister Rachel was talking about, certainly we, we have to examine things, we have to see, and, and I, I really believe there's no People say, well, that's a new sin, or this is a new sin. I don't, I don't think there are new sins. I think there's a new acceptance of sin. I think that's the part that really probably bothers me and drives me to realize how great a need it is for our world to understand. And when we talk about sin, it starts everybody automatically. Probably everybody in the room is like, oh boy, here he goes. Don't, that's, not the, that's not the way you need to feel. However, if we're guilty, maybe we need to feel that way a little bit sometimes. You see, I stand before you as an imperfect human being that realizes that I have sin in my life and I have problems and I have struggles just like everybody else. Anybody that works with me or knows me or anything, you know, if you know me very well, you probably walk away going, man, that guy is really, really, really in need of prayer. And that's okay. I am really, really, really in need of prayer. But what we find is that all of us, every single one of us, have the same contentions uh, in this world and sin is our big problem. That's where we have to really try to fix that in our own lives. Before we can try to fix others' lives, we've got to fix, fix it within ourselves. And that's what really is difficult for us to do. It's easy to look at somebody else and say, well, their sin is pretty heinous, but mine is not so bad. Because that's justification. Well, we might talk about that if we have time to get down into that in just a few moments of time. But I want to look in the book of Genesis, if you've got your Bible, in the third chapter. And these are very, very, very familiar uh, reading lesson. Uh, that we're going to try to take from this morning. And we teach our children these verses in Sunday school uh, from the time they're itty-bitty on up. And I want us to maybe examine them just a little bit uh, differently than maybe we have in the past, or maybe we've never broken them down in this way. But I want you to consider what's taking place here, the introduction of sin. And I want us to realize that at any point in our life, there may be... Uh, an enlightenment to a new sin, perhaps. Maybe in the past we've never had to contend with something, and then at some point something in our life changes or something comes along, and suddenly we're having to contend with a sin or something that's distracting that had never been there before. So I realize that as we mature and we age, we hope those things diminish, but certainly we, we understand that there could be at any point an introduction to something in our lives that is uh, devastating to us, and we find that Adam and Eve, I want you to consider for a moment the, the conditions in which Adam and Eve were created and given in the garden. You and I don't have a clue about the realities of living in a perfect world. We, we can't imagine that. We can't imagine looking around and everything being perfect. We can't imagine everything, all of our needs being met uh, without much difficulty or trial or tribulation. We toil and we strive to achieve everything that we do or to, to receive everything that we do. Uh, but we find that they were in this, this 
perfection. But then even that, in man's eyes, I want you to consider that perfection wasn't good enough. Now, that's a, that's a deep concept to consider. And we don't like to think about it, but the reality is when they had everything as perfectly as it needed to be and God provided their needs, suddenly we find that something was introduced that distracted the perfection. And we find in the third chapter of the book of Genesis that it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we find right there. We'll stop at that sixth verse. We find this very simple uh, uh, introduction of sin and how this has affected or how this has come into to mankind. Satan has always had this desire to corrupt and destroy that which God has made and that which God has designed. And we find that even in, in the, uh, the ideal of us having a relationship with God, and we find and I believe that Adam and Eve had a relationship with God, and certainly uh, his presence would, would not be foreign to them, nor would it be rejected by them. But then we find that Satan, again, desiring to distract and destroy and maim, uh, we find that he introduces sin, and he poses this, and I want you to think about how Satan works in your life. I want you to think how Satan works in my life. I want you to, to realize that as we examine what's going on here, uh, Adam and Eve have the same desires that you and I have. We're not different from them. They weren't different from us. We find that it's very similar across the board. Men are the same, and the human nature has never really changed. We find that, that all these things that are distractions today, certainly, I have no doubt that if, if, if Adam and Eve had had the Internet, there would have been distractions. I certainly believe if they'd had all these different influences, there would have been the same distractions that you and I have. But we find that Satan comes along, and we find in that first verse, the very beginning introduction of that, that third chapter, it says that Satan being that subtle, more subtle than any beast of the field, he went to the woman and said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now there's a question. He didn't pose it in the form of a statement. He didn't say, you know, God said, you can't eat of all these things. He introduced that question into Eve's mind. He said, did, did God tell you you couldn't do this? So I, wanna, I, want, I want you to think about your life, and I want you to perhaps examine for just a moment that there may be opportunities where Satan will take negative things, Satan will take sin in your life, and introduce it to you in a way that it seems to be questionable about whether or not it's really all that bad. That's what Satan's doing here. He knows how to work it, and he knows how to work Eve. And we find that Eve being separate at this point, or away anyway, for, for some distance or whatever, away from Adam, that uh, Satan takes that opportunity to talk to Eve away from Satan, or away from Adam, and he poses this question, uh, and he poses this doubt. And really, he's planting that kernel of doubt in her mind. Now, I want you to understand today, I believe Satan is operating the same way. He is trying to introduce every opportunity of doubt that he can into Christians' minds and into the rest of the minds of the world by saying, you know what, God says this, but it's really not all that bad, is it? It's really not as bad as you think it's going to be. It's really not as bad as what he said. And again, I want us to remember that when God gives us uh, uh, direction in his scripture, it's for our benefit. It's for our good, and our world wants to focus on the don't. The world wants to focus on can't. God wants us to focus on can and will and what's beneficial and good. God knew what the end result was going to be, and that's why he gave them the prohibition to eat of that fruit. Satan knew the same thing, but he also knew that with that introduction of sin, it would bring about separation from God. 
Now, I want you to consider for just a moment the effects of sin, and we'll get into that here in, in just a little bit. So he introduces a question, a seed or a kernel of doubt, into Eve's mind by saying, did God really tell you this? Out of all the things, and certainly as we think about this garden and we think about it being perfect and we think about all of God's provision, Satan wants us to focus on the can'ts rather than focusing on God's cans. I want you to think about that, church. I want you, if you take nothing else away, I want you to think about what the world tries to distract us and how Satan tries to distract us. When God says, oh, you can't do this, but what God is saying, don't do this because it's not good for you. I am opening up an abundant life to you. I give you abundance. I give you more. I give you all the provision and then some if you rely upon me. So then we find in verse 3, he said, This woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. She made a true statement. In the third verse, she goes on and says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat of it. Comma. Now here we have a little bit of something different. And out of all the reading and, and studying I've tried to do on that, and, and certainly there are a lot of different opinions about this, we find that in God's original prohibition, uh, he said... Uh, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. You eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you shall surely die. And then in the third verse, Eve goes on and says, You shall neither eat of it, nor shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, what do we, if we try to examine that a little bit, what do we find that Eve's saying? First of all, she said, Yes, God said we could do this, but we can't eat of this. And then she said, or touch it. Now, I don't, know if, I don't know if Eve's embellishing. I don't know if Adam perhaps introduced that to her and told her, you know, don't even, don't even touch it. We know that it's bad. And certainly, I, I told you all not too long ago, Levi was eating ant poison one time when he was a little kid. I, I think I had tried at some point in the past telling him, you know, don't eat this. And don't even touch it. I'm sure I went so far as to say, don't even touch it. And the next thing I know, he's going to town eating ant poison. Not good. It was not beneficial. It was not for his well-being. That, that wasn't why I told him not to do it. I knew it would not be good for him. And I, I hope it hasn't had a long-term effect, but we don't know. We're still waiting to see how that's all going to work out. But we find that God knew, don't do this because it's bad. Satan says, I, you know what, is it really that bad? Eve goes on and says, well, we can't do it, but, and we shouldn't even touch it. But then look at how she diminishes God's statement of if you touch it or if you eat of it, you shall surely die. She, did, she brings that down to three words, lest ye die. God said, you shall surely die. She brings it down to lest she die. And I think I, I have to believe that just like you and I, in our justification of sin, we start to list why it's okay. And it's really not as bad as we might think it is. You know, we, we see sin. We see sinful things. And, and we can start to list sin. And I, I, I'm not even going to get into that this morning. I'm not going to start to dissect which sin is worse or which is bad, which is good. Folks, sin is sin. And it's bad. Sin is never good. You're not going to prove to me that there's ever a point where the Scripture says that sin is beneficial. Sin is always, always bad. But then we find here that Satan introduces a big lie. First, he introduced doubt. He introduced that question of Eve saying, well, I don't know if it's really that bad. And then she, he goes on and says, you know what? In verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die? Well, guess what? That is just a bold lie straight from Satan. And I promise you that if you engage in sinful activities, Satan is going to be the one to tell you, listen, it's not all that bad. It'll be okay. You just try it one time. Try it one time. And I told y'all not too long ago, when I, when I was really trying to be strict on my diet, everything was good as long as I was strict. But then that one time that I try chocolate cake or whatever... And churches, Lord help us, we love, we love to have dinners and things, don't we? And the dessert table is always three times longer than every other table. I can't help it. I look and there's chocolate pie. I'm going to eat chocolate pie. 
I don't, know if, I don't remember what Brother Johnny's favorite pie was. That's not important to me. I just, I saw it and I, I, I took of it and then it started that vicious cycle. Satan will tell you one time is okay and then you'll be able to put it off. You don't have to do it again. But what we find is our human nature is once we engage once, the second time becomes easier. The third is easier than the second. And then we start down a path that we don't need to go. And we find here that uh, the, certain, the, Satan, the serpent said, you'll not surely die. And he goes on and says, for God knows that the day, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He initially said a lie. He said, you're not going to die. But then he said, God knows that the reason that you don't need to do that is because your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be as gods and you're going to know good and evil. Well, guess what? That statement was factual. That statement was true. We find that the lie was followed up with the truth. And if the truth had been first, perhaps the lie would not have been so easy to entertain and to digest. And it says that uh, then when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her. Let me tell you, folks, I really truly believe that our eyes can be our biggest obstacle when it comes to sin. Our eyes. You see, we take up a lot of things in our life, uh, but, but, and I, I liken it to when Shannon and I can go to Walmart. I, I'm going to pay. Go ahead and say it up front. We can be walking, we can go to Walmart, and, and I am one of those guys, list. I have a list. Don't deviate from the list, because if you do, it's going to cost more, it's going to whatever. Just stay to, your, stay to what you came to get. We can go to Walmart and we can walk in the door and we can go, you know, Walmart's marketing genius. They know what they're doing. But we can walk by and Shannon see something. Oh, look at those shoes. Aren't they cute? I'm like, no, they're not. They're, they're heinous. They're, idiot. they're horrible. I'm not, I wouldn't buy them. Oh, they're just perfect. And then she's distracted. I'm like, what about our list? We get, and she knows. We, we went to the Bahamas one time, and she was like, I'm going to the, uh, I'm gonna go in here, and I'm going to go to this straw market and, and shop. And she's like, you want to go? I was like, no, I don't. I don't. And I, I haven't lived that down yet either. I, I got in trouble for that because I didn't go. I didn't want to go. She knows. If, if, we're sh if she's shopping, I am a miserable human being to be around. I don't want to be there. I want to go in and get what I'm supposed to get. But her eyes now... Having said that, we can go eat somewhere, and I could leave there and drive past a Shoney's breakfast buffet, and my eyes are like, you know, there was a Shoney's back there. <laughs> we could go back and get some breakfast, and we could have eaten 20 minutes ago, but I'm like, they got a breakfast bar. It's better than the other breakfast. It's, you can get all you want. You can have whatever you want to get. That's my kind of thing. And my eyes are distracted by other things. She may look at shoes and dresses and things like that and say, oh, those are cute. I'm thinking, man, I could eat some, I could eat some biscuits and gravy. Let's go back. You see, I, our eyes are distracted and we are, we're taken up by different things. And Satan, my friends, knows exactly what will appeal to you. He knows what will appeal to me. He knows exactly the routes that he needs to take to get into our lives. He knows what, we, what can be introduced and how we can, how those things that will be most palatable to begin with. And then we find that it starts to build. And we find that that starts to take an effect in our lives. And it starts to tear us down whether we want to recognize it or not. But then we find that when they did this, and this is where we start to really examine the results. And what I want you to do today is take away from here the effects of sin in your life, the effects of sin in my life, and what it does to us and how it distracts us and ultimately destroys us. She took of the fruit and she gave it to her husband. Now, all men like to beat up Eve and say, you know what, she let the serpent beguile her and she took the fruit. Folks, we can get into that debate all day long, and that could be a long, drawn-out discussion of who's at fault. Let me tell you, I believe God gave the commandment to Adam, and I think Adam transgressed the law of God. Now, the woman was distracted by Satan. She did what she knew she was forbidden to do. When she introduced it to Adam, to whom the law, in my opinion, had been given, and he took of the fruit of uh, uh, that tree, and he ate of that, I believe that in that moment, what we find right here in the seventh verse, it says, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, God's 
rules, God's commandments, God's laws, everything that God had said is going to happen if you do this, guess what? God holds true to what he says. When God says there is a, uh, a punishment for sin, I promise you there is a punishment for sin. There's a reality that it's going to have a devastating effect in your life. When folks, when we start thinking about this, I want you to be able to walk away from here today going, I want to get further away from sin. I want to draw closer to God, and I want to realize the negative effects of sin in my life, what it does and how it can de destroy us. And we find that he, by uh, Adam, by looking and allowing his eyes to be distracted, perhaps Eve was very, uh, uh, very convincing. I don't know what the, the situation was there. But either way, when she introduced it, he took of it. He did that, and we find that he allowed his eyes and and his ears to change the direction of what was on his heart. Now, sin, and, and when we got to think about this, and, and we, we don't have time to dissect all these verses of Scripture today, but when we think about what sin does in our lives, and we'll think about the effects of it here in just a few moments of time, I want you to consider how sin affects our lives. I want you to know that I truly believe that the introduction of concepts and principles and sin into our lives, whatever the means has been to get it there, uh, I think that life has been neglected. I don't think we care about human life anymore. Anymore. I don't think we care about human beings anymore. I don't think we have, and I'm talking about generalities. Our church is very loving and kind and warm, and I appreciate that. But folks, we can watch video after video after video of people that just hate each other based on all kinds. There really doesn't even have to be an idea as to why it is. People just are filled with hate. Our world is consumed with envy. Our world is consumed with greed. Our world has taken up all this sin. And what we find is that it is destroying and it is tearing our world apart. Our eyes are easily distracted. What we allow to be introduced into our lives, folks, it's going to have an effect. We talk about video games. We talk about movies. We talk about all these things that are going on in our lives and people say well playing that video game doesn't really make it doesn't really affect us I believe every introduction of sin affects us every one of them there's no little introduction that's different than the big introduction I believe all these things are desensitizing us to the reality of sin in our lives television we can and, and anything Internet, television, I don't care what it is, it can be used for good. We're using the internet right now to try to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. That same internet introduces pornography and destructive things into the lives of people. I'm here to tell you, anything can be used for good or it can be used for bad. And my friends, what I want you to know is be careful about what you allow to be introduced into your life. And I stand before you just as guilty as anybody else. I stand before you as somebody who has allowed the influence of the world into my, into my life and into my heart by television, by the internet, and by all these different things, uh, by the things of the world that might be alluring to me, the things, and we all have those sins that affect us. Let me tell you, it's breaking us down. It's weakening our churches. It's weakening our families. It's causing us to say, well, it's not so bad. Just let it go. Let me tell you, it is bad. Sin is bad. I said sin is not so bad as a title, but that's the idea that the world wants us to have, that it's not so bad. It's not really going to break us down and tear us down. It's just a little bit here and there. Folks, it's just destroying us. Our churches are affected by it. Our lives, our families, all these things are just starting to be affected in such a great way. We see that now our world wants to tell us that everything that we want to we look at, oh, it's okay, just let it go on. But we find that if for a little definition of sin in 1 John 3 and 4, it says, whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law. When God tells us in his word, do this, don't do this, and we transgress that, whether it's by doing that which we shouldn't or not doing that which we should, the book of James tells us if we know, it's to, do, if we know to do good and we do it not, guess what does it say? It is sin. You see, we can do the good 
or we can do the bad. And most of the time, it seems like in our world, we choose to do the wrong thing. Numbers uh, 32 and 23, it says, But if, if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now, we don't like that verse of Scripture. We don't like to know that absolutely it's going to come out and it's going to be exposed and we're going to have this reality and this knowledge that it's bad and we've got this going on in our life. But folks, who are we really dealing with? Are you worried about dealing with me? Are you worried about dealing with the church? Let me tell you, you can do all kinds of things behind closed doors, but God knows everything that's going on in your life. That's the one that I want you to think about this morning. That's the one that you really need to be cautious about and prayerful about is, am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I where he needs me to be? And if you're not, then you need to get there. We find in Psalms uh, chapter 5, verse 4, God doesn't like or tolerate sin. I want you to remember that. We may say, well, he's put up with it. God has a permissive will, but in no way, shape, form, or fashion is God pleased with sin. You remember this thing called the flood? God was disgusted by sin. He was going to wipe out all of humanity. And then he changed his heart, his mind, and he allowed Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives, eight people to survive and repopulate the world. And guess what? Here we are today. Sin still just seems to rain. Not rain like the physical rain, but it seems to rain in our lives. You see, we're dealing with a God that does not like nor tolerate sin. In Psalms chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in the wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Think about these things. We're dealing with an almighty God who is holy and righteous and does not take up nor endorse or like sin. And then we find that our world just says, well, it's going to be okay. We can, we can have a little bit here and there. Sin's not all that bad. Let me tell you, sin is destructive. And we find in Habakkuk in 1 and 13, it says, Thou art of pure eyes, then to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. That's talking about God. God does not like to look upon iniquity. He does not like to see that, nor does he want to see that in our lives. He says, Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And Habakkuk even was posing that question. Why is it that the wicked seem to flourish when God's people and those that are pure of heart seem to be beaten down and seem to be just a weak? Well, we seem like we just can't keep going on. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Let me tell you, if there's a verse of scripture in my mind that uh, pretty well sums up the ideologies of our world today, it is that we have come to the point where we believe good is evil, and evil is good. Now I'm just going to stand on that. The world don't like to hear it. You may not like to hear it, and you may say, well, preacher, you don't know my life. I don't know your life, but I'm telling you, I can see the things that are going on in our world, and I, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we're at a point where people would much rather engage in sin than digest the Scripture according to the Word of God. That's where we're at. And, and you may say, well, that's not like that for all of us. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but, but I, maybe there's somebody here that doesn't realize just how, how bad sin is destroying your life and in your, in your family or whatever the case may be. And I want you to understand that there are consequences that come about when we have sin and allow sin into our lives. Genesis in, in the third chapter, but if we go back there, when their eyes were open and the reality of good and evil came upon them, what do we find that it did to them in that third chapter of the book of Genesis? What occurred in the 7th through the 11th verses? When their eyes were open and they took of that fruit and they ate that and their eyes became open, what did we find that they did? They looked up at themselves and they realized and they knew that they were naked. They had never noticed that before. Never had a problem with that. And I, and I got to thinking about that. And, and I don't know, and I don't mean this, uh, uh, please understand. To me, one of the most precious things when Levi was growing up, when he was a little bitty boy, the innocence of childhood is so precious. And he would get out of the bathtub and he would literally just run around the house. Just run around the house. Just right out of the bathtub. And it's like, yeah, there's nobody else here. It's not going to hurt anything. Let him run and play. And he'd run, he'd jump, and he'd play, and then we find that at some point along his life, he, he's, he's not as bad about it now as he used to be. <laughs> but at some point, he finally realized, you know what? I'm going to cover up. At some point, he started to understand that this is, this is bad. I, I need to hide this. 
And I used to love, as a, as a father and a, a mother, we'd love to give him a bath and just take his little, his little sweet, innocent body and just hold it tight. And just love that, just love that feeling of that, that relationship between the child and his parent. And I think about God in the garden, how they looked down and he had this relationship. How that he loved his children, he loved his creation, how perfect it was and how innocent it was until sin was introduced. And they decided, you know what, we need to cover up. We need to hide ourselves so that, so that our nakedness is not revealed. I miss the days of being able to hold my little boy in innocence and purity. I have to believe that God hurt immensely when he looked down and his children had ruined their innocence and purity. I wonder just exactly what he felt. And certainly, I have to believe he feels just like we do with our kids when they get to that point where sin is introduced and they understand that now I've got something to be afraid of, something I've got to hide, something I don't need to see and that the world doesn't need to see. And, and certainly, as we think about that, their eyes certainly were open. They were really, finally, they had that knowledge of good and evil, and it was brought to them. But it also came with a much larger penalty, and that was a separation of that relationship between them and God. They took fig leaves and they sewed them together to cover their bodies so that they could hide themselves from God. And you see, what we find is that sin in its introduction into our lives, we suddenly remember where we suddenly realize that this is bad. And, and thankfully, we have conviction about that. That's what they had when they realized they were naked and they sewed the fig leaves uh, and, and, and made themselves aprons. It said when they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves. Shame came upon them. And you may have, have never understood the, the idea and the penalties of sin. You may, have, you may just now be coming to the realization that sin in your life brings about a change that you've never experienced before. And that's what we call being lost. And we uh, suddenly become convicted because we find that this innocence and this purity is removed. And then we are accountable before God. Maybe that's never happened in your life. Maybe today is that first moment and first time when you finally realize, you know what? I am lost. I need God. I need to be restored. And what we find is that they hid themselves. They ran and, and hid themselves when they heard the voice of God in the garden in the cool of the day. They went and hid from the presence of God himself and, and amongst the trees of the garden. And, and, and remember, folks, we're dealing with Almighty God. He knows all, sees all. He knows everything about us. We can't hide from God. You can't hide your sin from God. And if you're lost, you can't hide being lost from God. He is the one that knows you. He is the one that made you and created you. He is the one that knows every single aspect of your life. You can't hide anything from Him. You can't be hidden from Him. And you certainly aren't going to be trying. You may try, but you're not going to be able to be away from His presence because He is everywhere. When you're lost, I, I remember as a lost person, as people would ask me, are you lost? And I'd try, to, I'd try to dodge that question. I'd try to tell them, yeah, I'm saved and just leave me alone or whatever. I'd try to get away from it. And there were times when I would even try to be the first out the back door so that I could get to the parking lot or get to my car because I knew people were going to come up after service and say, are you lost or are you saved? They'd come up and ask those questions, not because they, they hated me, but rather because they loved me. It may be disconcerting for a little bit, but I want you to understand they want you, and I want you, and God wants you. I want you to understand God wanted Adam and Eve, I believe, to continue in this happy, holy state. But we find that with the introduction of sin, these things change. And I want you to be able to have a restored relationship with God Almighty. And that's what we find that can happen. And when God uh, saw the, where they were and they were hiding, he called unto them. He said, Where are you thou? And they said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. Why would you have to be suddenly afraid of the one that had placed you in the midst of perfection? Why would you have to fear that? 
Why would you have to be afraid of him? Why would you have to do that? And we, I, can, I can tell you about it. I'm not going to give you some specific examples of Levi, but Shannon and I have some moments now where we look back and we kind of laugh. But what we find is that Levi, as a little boy, did some things that he shouldn't have done. One time, he, I will tell you one. <laughs> Levi is not a good liar. And I, that's, that's one good thing about him. He, had, he, had, he, came, he woke us up in the middle of the night. He was just tore all to pieces crying, crying his eyes out. And Shannon was like, baby, what is wrong? She didn't like seeing her little baby crying. He was like, I did something really bad. But he was about six. So I was like, he didn't rob a bank. I started going through the list of what really bad things he could have done. And it just, I mean, just tears pouring out of his eyes. And just, oh, I did something really bad. He was like, just tell us what you did. He said, I sprayed paint on the telephone pole. I was like, oh, man, this is terrible. I don't know what we're going to do with you. You just go on to bed, and we'll, we'll work your punishment out in the morning. And he went back to his room, and Shannon, I just dying laughing. You know, it's like, this is really not that bad. But the next morning, I went out, and I, I looked to see where he had sprayed paint. And I literally had to dig the grass back to find where he had sprayed the paint. But guess what he tried to do? He put the grass back to hide it. He had tried to go back and hide that, that he had done wrong. And then it started to eat at him. It started to work in him because he knew, you know, we just don't vandalize things. I think we tried to teach him that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we did a bad job because he spray painted a telephone pole. But I, I don't know. But either way, it started to eat at him. He started to feel bad. He recognized that he had done something he knew he probably shouldn't do. And he started to feel bad about that. You see, we come to that point in our life when... The introduction, the reality of sin makes us feel bad. Never felt that way before. I don't know that he had ever felt that way before. After that, he had several more instances. But I think that may have been the first one where his guilt started to really work on him. And then we find that in our lives today, as, as human beings, our sin and our guilt starts to work in us. And we start to have that problem, start to have that feeling. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve had going on here. They decided to hide because they were afraid of the very one who would provide every Everything that they need. Lost person, you may, you may just be coming to that point. You may for the first time today realize that you have done something so wrong. You've done something bad. And I want you to understand that sin is not something that's unique to any one of us. Sin is universal for all of us. All of us are sinful. All of us have sin, and all of us have these things. And, and I'm not talking about this individual little spray paint and a telephone pole. I'm talking about that inherited sin debt that Adam brought upon all of mankind in the Garden of Eden. That's what you have to contend with, my friend. And as Adam was uh, scared and he hid himself from uh, the face of God, he said, I realized, I, he said, I heard thy voice. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now God went on and said, and who told thee that thou wast naked? Now that was fairly rhetorical. God knew the answer before he asked the question. And I could probably now, looking back, I probably, after Levi opened himself up like that, I probably could have gone back at any point in any day and said, what would you do today that you're trying to hide from me? Knowing that there was probably something but I didn't do that. I, I missed those opportunities. I should have taken advantage of them. But we find that God said, what did you, who told you you were naked? And how did you know that? Have you violated my law? Have you transgressed that which I told you to do? And then we find that Adam did what all of us and women like to really throw up at us. Adam did what? He said, she did it. It was her. It wasn't me. It was all her. And I have done that so many times from the pulpit with Shannon. It's unbelievable. And it's never easy when we get to the house because I get the silent treatment for the next six to eight weeks. <laughs> no doubt he probably did too. But Adam said, the woman that you gave me. And, and see, in that, he even cast some responsibility back to God. He says, the woman that you gave me, she did this. She brought this, uh, uh, the fruit to me, and we ate of it. Uh, it was all her fault, but really, God, you did this to us because you gave me her. 
Now that's a convicting statement upon Adam. And what we find is the result is that God gave his commandments as to what was going to follow. And we find those penalties are there. And what we find is at that point, John uh, chapter 8 verse 34 says, Verily Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, who are unto you whoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. At that point, they became slaves chained and bound and you and I need to understand that the moment that we allow ourselves to engage in sin we become ensnared and enslaved to these things that's a dangerous and a painful condition to be involved in you see sin also brings about more sin I don't have time to go on through all these things but I'm going to real briefly cover some of these things sin brings about more sin Think about that. That first time, that first introduction, maybe it gets a little bit easier. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not so bad. But then we find it, it. Go back in the book of James chapter 1. Go over there when you get home and read, it, read James chapter 1 verses 12 through 15 or 16 and see what you take from those things. What we find is that when uh, uh, it says, When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We find that it just heaps on. And we, this little introduction becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately, and we, I was going to read first chapter of Romans. I don't have time to this. But ultimately, it brings about separation from God. Now, you may say, well, preacher, I've been saved for 20 years. Let me tell you, if you're engaging in sin repeatedly and you just keep on engaging in sin, it's causing separation between you and God. Your relationship can't be what it needs to be if you engage in sin repeatedly and habitually. Your relationship and your walk with God is not going to be as good as it needs to be. And lost person, I want you to understand, if you choose sin over the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you will eternally be separated from God. Sin's not so bad until it's in our life. See, if it's somebody else's sin, it's really not so bad. But then when it gets into our life, it becomes a bigger problem. John, in the 8th chapter of the book of John, when we find the woman that was caught in adultery, and those brought her to Jesus, and they were trying to say, you know what, let's condemn her, and let's catch Jesus in a little bit of a problem here. They said she was caught in the very act of adultery, and they brought, him, brought, her, or brought her forth, and uh, Jesus uh, bent down, began to write in the sand, and he began to say, you know what, whoever's without sin, cast that first stone. He said, if you're without sin, you want to condemn her, then, then you go ahead and do that. But while, while you're doing that, let me, let me just see where we're going to make some division points here. And let's see exactly who's going to be responsible for what. You see, they started to think within themselves, well, my goodness. I'm not without sin, and I'm not without sin, and I'm not without sin. And before long, we find that uh, they had left. She was standing there. And as uh, Jesus looked up at her and said, where are, your, where are your condemners? Where are those that are going to condemn you? She said, there's none here. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. And that's where we like to leave it. The world wants to tell you, Jesus doesn't condemn sin. God doesn't condemn sin. But what was the next thing Jesus said? Go and sin no more. Stop. Don't do it. Stop what you're doing. Fix it, get it corrected, and don't do it anymore. And we might say, well, this sin is big. My sin is small. Her sin is huge. His sin is just catastrophic, my friends. Sin is sin, and it's destructive. It's, it's horrible. We need to work to get it out of our lives, out of our homes, out of our families. And lost person, I want you to absolutely understand, if you continue to live in sin, you will do that right up, and you can do that, right up until you draw that last breath. And my friend, at that point, your condition is fixed. There's no going back. There's no backpedaling. There's no trying to get out of it. I want you to understand, if you die lost and separated from God, you will eternally be lost and separated from God. Your solution, you got to realize who you are. you got to recognize who you are. I absolutely, we've heard this. You've heard this from me. You've heard it from other preachers. You absolutely, and we don't talk a lot about confession of sin, and we don't talk about being a sinner and confessing that, but my friends, you absolutely have to recognize and confess to the Lord that you are sinful. 
that you've got sin and you absolutely need to come to him. And we find in the 15th chapter or the first chapter of the book of Mark, it says there is time fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You've got to repent. You've got to believe. You've got to trust and you've got to go to him and you must get it right. If you want to have relief from that burden, my friend, what we find is that God in the Garden of Eden, he said those leaves are not acceptable and he took animals and he killed them. He shed their blood and he created for them coverings that were brought about by blood. You see, if you're ever going to be saved, it's not because you're going to be good enough. It's not just because you recognize that you are a sinner. But my friend, it's got to be the blood must be applied to your life if you're ever going to be free from the bondage of sin. You've got to be born again. You've got to be saved. You must be made whole by the blood of Christ. So Jeff, I'll have a song. If today's the first day that you've ever realized that you're lost and separated from God and you need to seek Him, I would encourage you to do that. Maybe we've been saved for 30 years and we need to talk to God about the sin that's in our lives. Folks, we can hit the altars as well. We can pray and we can pour our hearts out just like a lost person can. But I would encourage you. Maybe you've been saved a while. If you've been saved and you've got sin in your life, let's work to get it out. Let's work to figure it out and try to figure out how we can diminish that, how we can reduce that, and ultimately how we can be free from that because that bondage restricts our Christian walk. If you're lost and you've never been saved, I want you to know that today is the day that you can come and seek the Lord for the salvation of your soul. While you have time and opportunity, won't you seek Him?